Welcome to the Advance Your Art podcast, where we talk about the journey from artist to entrepreneur and everything in between. You've worked hard to hone your craft. Now take it to the next level with tips, techniques, strategies, and routines used by successful artists to grow their businesses and careers. Now, let's get started and have some fun with your host, Yuri Cataldo. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Advance Your Art podcast uh, with Yuri Cataldo. If you're interested in learning how to build a company, make money from your art, or even transition to a new career, you have come to the right place. If you like this episode, please like and share this with a friend. Today, I'm chatting with Anna Rayborn, a classically trained opera singer and now the director of business development for Manifest Boston and co-founder of Hopscotch Labs. Anna, hello. Welcome to the show. Hi, Yuri. Thanks for having me. Of course. Thank you for joining me. Uh, Where are you calling us from? So I am calling you from my lovely backyard in Jamaica Plain, uh, <laughs> which is part of Boston, Massachusetts, uh, and it is a gorgeous day here. So we're just enjoying the outdoors. Great, great, great. And how has, uh, for people who are not in Boston, how has it been in Boston the last couple months? It's been, I feel like the word wild is a good <laughs> word for it. Um, You know, it's funny, it's funny, I'm sure you're hearing this from a lot of people, but at the beginning of this year, I had made goals for myself, and one of the goals was to simplify my life, and man, did the universe deliver. Um, I feel like I was forced to cut out everything that uh, I should have said no to to begin with, and um, here we are, so that's Boston. Yeah, yeah, okay, well, it's good to know. So... For my listeners who are less familiar with uh, you and what you do, how do you describe yourself? I, re- I would describe myself, this is going to sound a little bit aggressive, but as a recovering opera singer, um, mm-hmm. I think there's, there's a lot of, there's sort of some loaded terminology in that um, and sort of the rigorous training that you have to go through and the uh, just attitudes that come along with that career. And now it's interesting. So now I work for this really interesting organization called Manifest Boston, and we are responsible for the Hub Week Fall Festival, which is really um, sort of this jewel box of innovation and ideas that are happening in the Boston area. And we get to showcase that. And, Mm -hmm. you know, we're hoping to do we're hoping to do a lot for the city as far as raise its innovation platform. Um, and so it's my job to raise money and to go out and to actually talk about the festival with different corporations like Autodesk and, um, and uh, hopefully raise some money for us. <laughs> I like how you dropped that one in there. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's good. <laughs> you can Wait. edit that out. <laughs> no, no, no. We're, we're, we're definitely keeping that one in. Um, <laughs> which reminds me, I have to... I have to reply to a couple of your emails uh, after this anyway. So, so there's a couple of things you brought up, and I want to start unpacking those. So yeah. let's start with the, the recovering opera singer part of it. Yeah. What, what made you first interested in opera? What made me first interested in opera? Uh, honestly, that I was good at it. That sounds, that sounds funny, but, you know, no... 13 year old is out there singing opera unless you're on like America's Got Talent. Mm -hmm. Um, But when I got older, it just felt like my voice was better suited for classical music than it was for music theater. And uh, so that's what I did. Yeah, I was good at it. What was so how did you discover that? Was it were you in a class at some point or someone was like, that girl opera? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so a couple of different ways. I've been singing since I was a very small child. You know, I remember going to auditions as like a six year old, you know, all, okay. all dressed up, ready to go. Um, and I've been performing since then. And it must have been when I was in high school was when it really kind of clicked for me that that was a, a better career path for myself. Mm-hmm. Um, I did take voice lessons. You know, I was in chorus. I did all those 
things that typical, you know, kids who are interested in music and theater do. And of course, my teacher being a classical teacher started us with those fundamentals. So I always did some level of classical music, even if I wanted to like belt my heart out, I wasn't allowed to do it until I had mastered some of the fundamentals. Um, and I started winning competitions. And so to me, it, it was just a natural, like positive reinforcement thing more than anything else. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Okay. So then, so you were doing that and then, so did you study classical music in college or what was your journey like in that? Yes, I have a bachelor's in arts bachelor's of arts in uh, vocal performance from Elon University, which is a small conservatory in North Carolina. And they are mostly known for their musical theater program, but they have a really solid uh, classical voice program as well. And then I took a year off and I started at Boston University doing classical uh, voice there as well in their master's program. And then about halfway through, and this is where I think my journey is interesting for your listeners and for this podcast, about halfway through, I sort of threw my hands up in the air and was like, I'm never going to make any money doing this. Like, I don't, I don't love it enough. I mean, yeah. I, I love it. There's like a part of me that will always miss it. And, and I think I thrived in the discipline of having that kind of structure in your day of like, okay, you get up, you go to class, you are in the practice rooms for hours on end and then you go work out and then you practice some more. Like I thrived in that sort of like rigorous environment. Yeah. Um, but I sort of stopped loving performing and what are you, what are you going to do? Are you just going to practice forever without any like main goals? So at that point I had um, met the person who I was dating, who uh, became my husband. And we sort of had a really serious sit down talk. And it was like, okay, what else can I do? And I'd always heard, you know, sort of a segue into your last question. I, the best piece of advice that any of my teachers ever gave me was if you can do anything else, do something else. <laughs> like, like to really thrive as a performer, you really have to like eat, live, sleep, and, and love this craft. Mm -hmm. And if you, if there is something else that you feel like you want to do, like go explore it because this isn't for you. Yeah. It's interesting that that quote had the opposite effect on you. So, you, so, I mean, I have a similar kind of classical trained background, but in theater. And of course, that's like the go-to thing that all your professors tell you. Oh yeah. And it seemed like, at least for my journey, I was like, well, yeah, that's like my rallying cry of like, yes, I will go and I will be that exception to the rule mm -hmm. that succeeds. And because other people have done this and succeeded in this and, and made a living. I am, I want to talk about that moment where mm -hmm. you were like, you know what? Was it, so was it a conversation with the professor? Was it just like, were you sitting somewhere? That moment where you were like, you know what? I love this, but this is not what I should be doing right now because mm -hmm. that that takes a, a level of self awareness that is that m I guess many people in in university mm -hmm. don't have and to know that about yourself it takes a lot of courage and to to realize that you know what I've studied for so long and done this for so long that I'm now going to just stop and go do something else so what was do you remember that moment what what caused that moment Yeah I was sitting in a lesson with my voice teacher at the time and we were working on something i think it was like something from deflate a mouse or you know mine hair marquee like a fairly like solid typical song that that you would do and we were we were working on it and she just like stopped me and she was like are you going to are you going to use this are you going to like go out and and audition for things at the BLO or, or whatever, like, what is your, what is your point in doing this? Mm -hmm. And I sort of sat there and thought to myself and I was like, you know, I don't really want to go audition for the, for the BLO. Um, and I definitely don't want to go with like this song. Like if I'm, if I'm going to do it, I want to be the, the very, very best. And I know that I am not, I don't have like the heart and soul to be the very, very best. Um, which may, which may make me sound like 
I don't try hard enough or, or whatever, but I, I just knew that there was other things I, I could do and wanted to do with my life. And that was sort of the, t- the turning point for me. Yeah. That's fascinating. Okay. Mm-hmm. I, I had, as a sidebar, I had a similar conversation with a professor, but not in the arts. It's when I was studying to be a mechanical engineer. Oh my it was God. this, it was a similar, like, why are you here moment? Mm-hmm. So that's fascinating. I think that's a good charge out to all professors who are listening to this, that maybe you should ask your students more of like, why are they here? Yeah. Okay. So, so you made this switch. And so what did you end up doing then? Um, after you made the decision to move on to something else? What was that something else? I followed my dad's advice and I marched my little body over to the temp agency <laughs> in, in uh, Beacon Hill. And I said, I need a job. Here's, what, here's the skills that I have. I've done a couple of unpaid internships because arts administration doesn't pay you anything. Right. Um, and, and they said, great. Uh, here is an admin job at MIT. Um, go for it. And so what what really should have been two weeks ended up being like three and a half years of my life. And I worked for a professor there who was, he wasn't a professor, sorry, an executive director, an assistant dean, associate dean, sorry, um, there who I think really, for whatever reason, saw something saw something in me and I was able to sort of weasel my way into his heart. <laughs> like, I don't know. I don't know what the word is, but I think yeah. he, he and my, my direct manager, I think really like pushed a baby bird out of, out of their nest and challenged me in a lot of different ways. And um, so from there I went, uh, jumped within MIT to MIT technology review and fell in love with media mm-hmm. and um, journalism and working with journalists and, and, a little bit of the advertising world because that's what I did there, and uh, here I am at Manifest Boston. So that's it. That's my. That's my yeah, team. yeah. Which is it's so it's. I think that's absolutely fascinating and and mm-hmm. really interesting. So let's talk about your days at the MIT Technology Review, and then what then landed you to where you're at, at Manifest Boston. Mm-hmm. So you, looks like you had a, a few different roles there. How did you? So with your with your background, how did mm-hmm. you navigate these different roles? And how did you, let's say, I mean, because you started at one level and then at the end you became a you know, senior senior mm-hmm. project manager and what you're doing now is at the even higher level. Mm-hmm. How have you used your background to your advantage in mm-hmm. th- this world to continually be promoted? Hmm. That's a great question. The thing that I learned from the arts, number one, is people skills and self-marketing. I think being able to really like understand where your value lies is really important. And for me at Technology Review, there were a couple of different things. I think there was being able to think creatively on your feet. So what I did for them in in and what I do for Manifest Boston is I really think of ideas that would resonate with our clients. Mm-hmm. And um, at the time, and I don't mean to toot my own horn, but at the time, like we didn't have, we didn't have a marketing team that helped us with this. Like it was literally just me um, and a couple of our teammates coming together to really like see, like kind of almost like it was, and I'm sort of pushing this to put it within the context of the arts, but almost taking each uh, request for proposal and breaking it down like it was a script and understanding the motivations behind it and understanding what the other player, what they really need and want out of a conversation with you. And I think being able to do that along with just being like a genuinely pleasant person and um, got me, has gotten me to where I am so far which has been, I, I mean, I've, I've been overwhelmed with the sort of professional career that I've had, given that I ha- like have literally had zero experience <laughs> in the professional world. Um, so yeah, that's kind of, that's what I feel about that. Yeah. Okay, great. And then, so at what point did you want to make the, the jump from what you're doing at MIT Technology Review mm-hmm. to what you're doing now at Manifest Boston? Um. So I was coming to a point with my career at